This top five is going to be about the tanks that NATO has recently announced it's going to be gifting to the Ukraine. Now, with the tank in the news so much at the moment, we thought we'd take this opportunity to look at some of the capabilities and characteristics and a little history of these five tanks. Now, unlike previous top fives, I'm going to be doing this in reverse order for a very good reason. So let's get started. Please remember to like, subscribe or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Well, this is number one. This is the tank that really started it all. Because in mid-January of 2023, the British government announced the following. The United Kingdom's accelerated package of aid consists of a squadron of Challenger 2 tanks with armoured recovery and repair vehicles. This was seen as a breakthrough, opening the gambit for more recent NATO Western tanks to be given in support of the Ukraine. Early reluctance was centred around the idea that weapons provided were for the defence of the Ukraine, not weapons, that could be used for attack. Initially, Boris Johnson had chosen to deploy British Challenger 2 tanks to Poland to backfill the Polish army, allowing the Polish government to donate T-72s to the Ukraine. This dilemma has been put aside over time, as how a weapon might be described as defensive or offensive is open to argument. And if Ukraine is going to free land occupied by Russian forces, it's bound to need to attack the occupiers. FE 4034 Challenger 2 first went into service with the British Army back in 1998. It was a design started by Vickers as a private venture as early as 1986. And this was put up as a possible replacement for Challenger 1. Um, you can go back and look at our tank chat on Challenger 1 because that was a tank that the Army wasn't particularly wanting, but it was filling a gap. Only 440 Challenger 2 tanks were actually built and only about 38 were exported, they went to Amman. Now it's a sad in a way because Challenger 2 came into service at a time where other countries weren't really buying tanks, which is led to a bit of an irony because it's been a very successful vehicle with that Dorchester armour, that Chobham secret armour, being tremendously protective, very good. We've not lost a crew member in a Challenger 2 tank. For Britain as well, involved in counterinsurgency wars for the last 20 years, tanks haven't been a priority weapon and they haven't been used in many numbers. They've declined to 227 on the books, um, but a lot less are in actual active operational use, the wider fleet having been stripped to supply spare parts for those that are still in service. In the Army's 2020 restructuring, only three Challenger 2 tank regiments will remain. The Queen's Royal Hussars, the King's Royal Hussars and the Royal Tank Regiment, each of which is a tank regiment of an armoured infantry brigade. There's a backup regiment, the Royal Wessex Yeomanry, which will provide reservist Challenger crews to the regular regiments if they're ever needed. In March 2021, the British Army announced plans to upgrade 148 of those Challenger 2s under a life extension programme with the aim to extend its service life to at least 2035. Now that project is leading to what we now know of as Challenger 3. The gun on the original tank is a rifled 120 mm 55 caliber long L30 A1 tank gun. The problem is ammunition has been run down as the new upgrade to Challenger 3 uh, comes online and that's going to have a smoothbore gun, so different types of ammunition. Even as we're filming this, Ukrainian crews are in the UK training on how to use Challenger 2. And the Defence Procurement Minister announced that the 14 Challenger 2 tanks that are being gifted to Ukraine will be in country by the end of March 2023. <laughs> Of course, the Challenger 2s weren't the first tanks NATO countries helped supply to the Ukraine. As soon as the fighting started, 
Soviet era tanks were assembled to pass on. Most of those were based on T-72 variants and that's why it's my number two. Poland supplied PT-91 Tavardi tanks in July 2022 with an additional 30 tanks pledged by Poland earlier in January this year. The PT-91 is a Polish-made battle tank that came into service in the 1990s. It was developed from the Soviet area T-72M range. A total of 232 tanks were produced. It's got a Polish 12-cylinder turbo diesel engine. It's got a French fire control system and a passive night vision system. Additional armour has been added under the driver's seat and a domestically produced active armour called Iwa. Now I'm probably saying that wrong so forgive me but it's an interesting new concept. It's got protective blocks over the front part of the hull and turret with almost no gaps in between them. They've got a coating on as well which reduces the visibility of the tank in the infrared and uh, it also protects against radar. It's been estimated that Iwa could increase the survivability of the PT-91 by about 30 to 70% depending on the type of projectile that's being fired at it. Such a protection system is a significant advantage compared to those earlier T-72 M1s and T-72 M1Rs which were sent to the front. They had to be equipped with additional protection systems such as the Contact One dynamic protection system uh, that were obtained from the Czechoslovakia before they were handed over to the Ukrainians. A modern laser warning system identifies if you're being targeted by laser beams, uh, often used on missile launchers uh, or any other sort of missile guiding system, and that automatically fires smoke grenades from two banks on either side of the turret. Each of those has got about six launchers. The T-72 variant is an important vehicle on both sides in this war. At the beginning of the war, Ukraine had about 500 T-72 and T-72As in storage. By January of 23, 312 T-72 tanks have been visually reconfirmed captured. Um, that's the biggest number of all the captured Russian tanks taken by the Ukrainians. Various other countries have also donated T-72s to the Ukraine. I've got here United States, Poland, the Netherlands, the Czechs, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, 20 Moroccan T-72B tanks were sent to the Ukraine in January after being modernised in the Czech Republic. So this is still a very important vehicle that NATO is helping to support in the Ukrainian army. The next tank I want to look at is a Leopard 2. And don't worry, I do understand that's a Leopard 1 behind me. Sadly, we don't actually have a Leopard 2 in our collection, but we have had one on loan to us from the Royal Netherlands Army, and we've had it here at Tank Fest driving around, but not one in the collection at the moment. Now, why is Leopard 2 important? There's been much debate in the news as Germany, as the license holder, had to approve end user certificates before any other countries wanting to give their Leopard tanks to the Ukraine were allowed to. That painful debate on whether this was a good idea for the Germans was played out in public in January 2023, leading finally to the agreement that Leopard tanks could be sent. So far we have seen it would approve the delivery of about 80 Leopard 2 tanks to the Ukraine, including about 14 of its own tanks, um, and this would be part of a coalition with other European countries. And 14 of those Leopard 2 A6s would be taken straight from the active Bundeswehr inventory, in other words, straight from the German serving army. The aim is for NATO to supply about two battalions worth, or about 88 tanks to the Ukraine. Early ones maybe takes up to about three months, Others are going to take long, longer. Some of those, as I said, they're from the Bundeswehr, the German army stocks. Others are from the manufacturer, Rheinmetall. And they've said that some of those that are held in long-term storage are going to require quite a bit of extensive refurbishment and updating before they could be considered suitable for combat in the Ukraine. January the 26th, Pistorius, the German Minister of Defence, stated that the tanks would be delivered in late March or early April. 
along with the 14 tanks pledged by Germany, four have been pledged by Canada, 14 by Poland, three by Portugal, and others are likely to be coming. So with Leopard 2, there were two main development tranches. Leopard 2 up to A4 has got that very distinctive flat face on the front of the turret, on the front of that turret armour. From Leopard 2 A5 onward, we get that arrowhead of a plique armour that gives it that very distinctive wedge shape. And that is very effective against not only trying to stop fin rounds, but also hollow charge rounds. Following Leopard 2's introduction into service in 1979, that very mobile tank has been able to add improved levels of armour over the years. And those distinctive arrowhead shapes of the newer turrets, they've got improved protection against both kinetic penetrators and shaped charges. The gun is 120mm smoothbore of 44 calibres in length, and then with the new A5 variant of Leopard 2, that's now a longer barrel gun of 55 calibres. It's fully stabilised and can fire a variety of types of rounds, such as the German DM43, AP, FS, DST tank, anti-tank round, which is said to be able to penetrate about 560 millimetres of rolled homogeneous armour, that's about 22 inches of steel, at a range of about 2,000 metres. For the longer L55 gun, a newer armour-piercing fin-stabilised discarding Sabo round was introduced to take advantage of that extra long barrel. That's a DM53. This is able to penetrate around 750 millimetres of rolled homogeneous armour at a range of around 2,000 metres. One of the keys about this tank is the ability of these guns to destroy enemy armour at a distance further than that which the enemy can effectively target them. It's still a very mobile tank as its original name was. Um, it can go about 68 kilometres an hour. It can go about 31 kilometres an hour backwards so it can get out of trouble quick as well and reposition itself. And its weight has increased but it's still under about 60 tonnes. The key thing about why leopards have been in the news so much is because various countries have been running them, therefore the fleet of Leopard 2 tanks out there is larger than any other single type apart from probably Abrams and the fact that it's European tank with the manufacturers based in Europe, that means as well the idea of ammunition, spares, crew training, etc. This is the tank that there's more opportunities for NATO to support than any other. My fourth tank is in a way a bit of a late entry. It is actually this tank now. This is a Leopard 1. Now this is a tank whose design started way back in the 1950s for the newly formed Bundeswehr. Um, and it was based on the idea that the Germans, they didn't want to follow their Second World War design of a very big heavy tank um, with strong firepower. They wanted to keep that strong firepower. They got the British 105mm L7 gun, but they went for relatively light armour and great mobility. Why it's become important now is that the German government has approved the original manufacturer, Rheinmetall, um, to be able to sell 88 of tanks, at least Leopard 1 tanks, that have been in long-term storage. Why this has become an important tank is the German government has approved the German arms manufacturer, Rheinmetall. It's allowing them to sell 88 of the low, older Leopard 1A5s to the Ukraine for about 100 million euros. Now, there are problems with this. Leopard 1s are no longer produced. Their weapon is that 105mm rifled L7 British tank gun that's still in use with a number of countries, but the ammunition is getting harder to find. And of course, sustaining a tank that is no longer made or actually being operated by many people, again, that means spare parts are going to be harder to find. However, there are some other countries in Europe that still have stocks of Leopard 1s. Belgium, for example, they have quite a number. Now, it won't be a tank that matches the sophistication of the latest Russian tanks, but as we've talked about here before, 
sometimes any tank is, gives a great advantage, especially if it's fighting against infantry or other forces that don't have tanks at that time. And again, if you turn up with a tank at the right time, you've got that mobile firepower and a 105 millimeter gun that can really make a difference. So my thoughts are that this is still an important tank that if it gets out to Ukraine in numbers, can help make a difference. My fifth choice is the American Abrams tank. Now again, I'm very much aware this isn't an Abrams. Uh, we're still working on trying to acquire one for the collection. This is the, one of the family of Patton tanks, this particular one, the M48, that the Abrams actually ended up uh, replacing. Now, back on 25th of January, 23, American President Biden actually approved for the first time the use of 31 Abram tanks to be sent to the Ukraine as part of a larger support package. Um, the Pentagon said the tanks would be the M1A2 variant and as they weren't actually readily available in existing US stocks, they'd be bought through a system that they're calling the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. The Abram stems back from a failure of an earlier project, the MBT-70, um, which was supposed to replace the M60 and that family of vehicles. The reasons why that MBT-70 project failed are so often repeated, you know, in so many other projects as well. Um, they end up getting too complex, the costs go up and through the roof, and time becomes an issue as they overrun all their different deadlines. That initial project for MBT-70 was actually a joint one between the Germans trying to replace their Leopard 1s and the Americans at the time, but they both decided to go their own ways. So a new tank was still going to be needed, especially as the T-62 with its 115 millimeter gun was being put out into Soviet and Warsaw Pact forces. That was the new threat this new tank was going to have to come up against. Now, back in 1973, Chrysler Defence and a rival company, General Motors, they both submit designs. Chrysler's has a one and a half thousand horsepower gas turbine engine. General Motors uses similarly powerful, but it's just a diesel engine. There's discussions about fitting a new 120 millimetre gun to the Abrams, but because Firstly, ammunition for that new 120 mm gun hasn't been fully developed and there's already large stocks of 105 mm ammunition already available in the US arsenals. The decision is made, go for the L7 105 mm gun built under license and that's the gun that goes in the early models of the Abrams M1. In 1976, prototypes are tested and in July, General Motors was about to be chosen as the main contractor. But in the end, that doesn't happen. It's pretty much a political decision is made that they're going to go for the Chrysler version um, that's being offered instead. And uh, confuse matters even more. General Dynamics Land System in 1982, they end up buying Chrysler Defence after Chrysler had built, uh, built about 1,000 M1 Abrams tanks. Now in the first tranche, 3,276 Abrams, they're produced from about 79 to 85, they're just the M1 variant, they enter service with the American Army in 1980, 5,000 more Abrams, M1A1 variants, are built from 86 to 1992 and that's got that newer M256 120mm gun put on it, which is a smoothbore gun. It's actually the gun that's developed by Rheinmetall that goes onto the original Leopard 2s. It's got improved armour. Now, of course, there's an American visit to the UK. They see what Britain's doing with Chobham, so they stop the uh, initial design programme, adding Chobham armour. And uh, they've got, a, even after that as well, they go for an improved armour with depleted uranium and other types of laminate, uh, still classified materials. And in all, there was about 9,000 uh, Abrams of M1 and M1A1 variants produced, about $4.3 million each. That's the estimate of how much unit cost was. Now the M1A1 can kill tanks at ranges in excess of 2,500 meters. Now that range was crucial when it was fighting previous generation Soviet tanks in things like combat such as Desert Storm 
because the effective range of many of that generation, T62, T72 tanks, is around 2,000 metres. The lack of interest in the early 2000s in main battle tanks meant that famous factory in Lima, Ohio, by 2016 it had got down to only 100 workers there. One Abrams a month was actually going through to re be refurbished. Now look at how times have changed. Suddenly, I mean, that, that was actually even debated in Congress at the time, that worry about if we lose capacity, what happens if we need it? And at the moment, of course, suddenly the world wants tanks again. So they're up to about one and a half thousand workers there at the moment, and tanks are being put through at a much quicker rate to get back to the various countries that want to use the Abrams. And there's a number of them out there it's been exported to, and of course, service these orders so that Abrams can actually end up going to the Ukraine. So those three main variants of the Abram, the early M1s, the M1A1, and now an M1A2, each of them has got uh, increased firepower, better improvements in sensing, electronics, engine output. That idea of that improvement means that the Abrams, for many countries, is seen as one of those technologically advanced vehicles that again, when it was designed back in the Cold War, it had to be better than the more numerous Soviet era tanks. It's now got its moment to actually show its worth against that generation tanks and with a much more near peer sophisticated army using those tanks as opposed to when we were seeing them being operated in the Middle East. Most of these tanks we've been talking about date from their design at least in the Cold War period but they've now got better firepower, better levels of protection, and in some cases, more powerful engines. But why does Ukraine want these tanks? In our next video, we're gonna be looking at that and trying to find out how the tanks as well might be being used. I hope you found this interesting. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel or try and support us through Patreon.